play. Play is a beautiful thing. We do it because it feels good. It's nature's way of telling us how to interact with others, learn about ourselves, learn about the world, learn about how others think and feel. So my name is Magnus, and I work at the LEGO Creative Play Lab. And I'm especially honored to be here today, not just because you're here, but because this is my hometown. So this is where I grew up. <laughs> Mama. This is where I learned how to play, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, LEGO Creative Play Lab. Here we go. So what we do is we're hunting the next big LEGO experience. And we are the creators of things like LEGO Friends and LEGO Ninjago. You've probably heard about those. So they start with the Creative Play Lab, where we kind of create the seed, and then we push it down into the pipeline, the portfolio, and then keeps on rolling year on year. But we also do pilots. So pilots are these oddballs of projects that we put out to test the waters. Um, and we also do, sorry, push the wrong button. We also do a lot of collaborations with um, universities and other companies, tech companies especially, where we kind of see if we can find an interesting play experience with LEGO and technology. And we're big kids at LEGO. And it helps to have a playful mindset if you work at LEGO, because if you want, you can play all day. Um, but there's an important thing here. We're big kids. We're not kids. And this is very important to us to understand um, that we need to put down all these thousands of hours every year to understand kids. And yes, we do test at LEGO. But the most interesting thing is when we go to kids, when we watch kids play at home, we go all over the world and watch them play with our toys, with other toys, with their friends on their own. We need this to understand kids. We've been doing this for many years now. LEGO is an old company. Um, so we kind of made this map. And this map is over every single type of play you can do. So we kind of divided play in all these different parts. And there is about 30. It's, it's shifting all the time. But about 30 different types of play. And we use these tools to describe the products that we have. We have 22 product lines. And they're all made of Lego. So of course, we have a problem with cannibalizing on each other. So to make sure that we don't overlap too much, we use these play types to describe the play that we're doing with the different toys. We also use it in Creative Play Lab, because using those, we can describe play and see if there's something new. Is there a new mix of play here? And if there is, then we're on to something. I'm going to do an example for you. So imagine you're seven years old, and you built this house. And then this little dude shows up, moves into the house. That's sad. That's lonely. So he needs a friend. This also moves into the house. Let's see if I can. Yep. And for some reason, there's always a baby showing up. <laughs> so the baby shows up, and it's dirty. So the baby needs cleaning. So you find this little pot here, put the baby in, and you walk to the bathroom. And the baby wants a bubble bath. So you pull out some shampoo, and you pour it on the baby. <laughs> and now you're having fun, but then what about toothpaste? What happens when you put toothpaste on the baby? Then your sister walks in, and she says, I'm going to finish that story later. I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> what I'm trying to say here, I forgot to push the buttons here a couple of times. <laughs> All that stuff happened already. Um, is that kids play 
fluidly. They move through play. They switch, and they don't even think about it. But with this map that I was talking about before, we can describe what actually happened. So when we built the house, we were doing construction play. Then we went on to doing third-person role play. Then we went on to do nurture play when we were taking care of the baby over there. And then we went on into experimentation play when we were trying to find out what happens. So we can see this because we have this tool. And looking at kids playing, this is actually when we adults, we say, oh, kids are so creative because they move through this play, switching without thinking. And that's something that we lose as adults. Because adults, grown-ups, we want to play too, right? We want to play too, right? Yeah. Yes, of course, thank you. The difference is <clears throat> that we, we kind of forget how to switch, how to move fluidly. So we kind of stick to one play. And one play that probably a lot of you do is collectability play. So collectability play for a child is collecting soccer cards or maybe characters or Star Wars figures. Um, but adults, we collect chili plants or sneakers <laughs> or handbags or watches. It's the same play. We just don't think about it. So <clears throat> the basic need of play doesn't change, but the expression of play does. So it changes from being a child, expressing it one way, to an adult, expressing it one way. It also changes because the world is changing. And I could talk about this topic of things changing in the world affecting play for a long time, but I'm just going to do an example. This is one thing that's changing. Kids have very busy schedules. Um, they have school, they have after uh, school, they have sports, they have chores. There are a lot of things that they need to do every day. So what's happened is they slice their time and they slice the play. Because if you have a 30-minute window of playing, a kid won't pick a play that they can finish in 30 minutes. <laughs> they will go for something that's fun, something that they have passion for, um, and then they will pause. And usually they will actually pick it up later and continue. So they will do this several times during the day, and that's called stitching play. And this, of course, is a challenge for a toy company because we need to kind of design that thing in where you can actually pause your play. So that's a challenge for LEGO. Another thing that's changing, of course, is technology. Um, and I'm going to go and do some examples of um, where I think we're just about to break through. So these are very new things you're going to see. We're in the struggle of joining these two worlds. So let's get back to the baby. So you're sitting here with your toothpaste. You, your sister walks in and says, are you making slime? And you weren't really, but that sounds awesome. <laughs> so you pick up a device, and you check out a tutorial on how to make slime. And all of a sudden, baby is bathing in slime. <laughs> so the earlier version of this example, we were just doing physical play, right? The play that we could have done when we were kids. Uh, but now we had a device that pulled it up, and they went back to the play. And for them, it was just one flow. Still, just one flow of play. It's just that we see it so clearly that they actually went into a digital world and then back. But kids don't care. Kids don't see this divide that we so see so clearly because we didn't grow up with this digital part. That's something that we kind of learned how to do along the way. Like, I think it was Shuli who said it, they're digital natives. They grew up with this. Parents, however. Parents, however, see this divide super clearly because they also see that kids are moving from physical play into digital play, 
and they're not leaving. They're getting stuck there. Because from a child's perspective, there's a lot of different ways to play with this digital toy. I don't even need to move. So parents are fearing this pacifying function uh, effect that um, the devices have. So that's something that we've been seeing for a while now, like this movement from physical to digital, but not going back. So these examples are just new, fresh, um, of how we can actually switch that around. So this example is from um, Lego Duplo. It's called Lego Duplo Stories, and it's an Alexa skill. And the Alexa skill is not so much about stories, like an audiobook. Um, it's more of a prompting. It's kind of a friend helping you to move along in your play, kind of when you feel you need a little inspiration. So this is what happens. So we have this physical play, and we're playing with our small dogs here. And you can, oh, Alexa. Alexa, tell me a story about dogs. And Alexa, fully logical, she will reply, it's raining. <laughs> OK. Oh my god. I need to do something. This is called a call to action. So now you need to build a shelter. So we can use this, trying to be funny in this example, but we can use this to prompt play and continue play. Well, this is quite a simple example, you might think, because the kids still have both, both hands in the physical play, right? So this is just audio helping along. Um, what about if you need to hold something, if you need to hold the device? Then it becomes trickier. So I'm going to show you this video here. This is something that we did and showed at the Apple conference before the summer. And, and um, yes, let's here watch we it. Have assembly square. So, <clears throat> sorry if the example is a little cut up, it's because of the time constraints here. But what's happening, I'll run you through what's happening here. This is an augmented reality, of course. Um, but what's actually happening is that we're moving from physical to digital. You got that right? So we have the physical set, in the assembly square, and you're scanning you're that set, makes it come alive. So now you're in the digital world, you're watching your set, but you can actually see in the inside, and now it's populated. You can build the surrounding world. You can even do it together with your friends, which is a huge breakthrough from play perspective, because you can build this together with a friend, but recent, um, before, we haven't been able to actually play together with a friend in this way, digitally. But the most important thing that happened was the little baker. The little baker did something. He prompted you. He gave you a call to action. He said, you need to save this building. So that's why they put the fire truck in and, and rescued those clowns from the roof. We could just as easily prompt somebody to go back to the physical play. Because we could say, we need you to build something. We need you to build a tree, because birds need it or we needed to build a vehicle to do this, save somebody. We can prompt, with this technology, we can prompt somebody to move back into the physical play. And that's maybe the first time we can say that we have a fully fluid play, moving into the digital, back to the physical. The kids won't notice. We do, but that, 
that's not the point. So, to sum this up, technology, whatever it is, it's not going to be the one future for play or toys. And the same thing that physical play is not dying. It's still going to be there. That's, that's not an interesting discussion. What we need to remember is that we need to plant these, especially from a toy maker perspective, we need to plant these transitions where we can enable the kid to move from physical to digital and back again so that they don't get stuck. That's the way the future is going to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. Thank you so much.